My spiritual journey continues on this episode of In the Flows podcast. Stay tuned for my conversation with David Wiley, a healer living and breathing in Mexico. David learned healing from the traditions of the indigenous people who have been living a spiritual life in this part of Mexico in Morales for thousands of years. Many people believe that spiritual healing began when spirit came to indigenous people all over the world thousands of years ago at the same time. I was curious as to why he came to this region. Is this area a powerful energy vortex? Uh, you know, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm kind of brought into the traditional view. So we don't look at things in terms of energy vortexes. Uh, uh, you would say that I am surrounded by, uh, in the Valley, I'm surrounded by some very, uh, unique and, uh, interesting looking mountains. Uh, and so, uh, uh, we don't see things and we don't talk about things in terms of, energy like uh, energy is like a kind of a physics scientific uh, uh, secular kind of uh, designation uh, the world is alive and uh, and influential uh, in many ways and so uh, this valley uh, probably similar to uh, maybe Sodoma uh, has a uh, quite a lot of character in terms of these expressions. So you are, let me try to understand a little bit more. You are saying that it's not that there's these, these influences aren't necessarily human beings. They could be many different types of things that have spiritual energy. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, uh, spiritual force, spiritual uh, volition, because uh, that, that implies a volition in order to have a relationship. And, uh, and of course, uh, what you have here is rather than having, you know, one just, like if you were in, you go 40 miles and then you have the Popocatepetl, which is this, uh, about an 18,000 foot mountain. He's, he's just kind of there. And uh, so that's, that's one. But here you would say, if you're surrounded by them and uh, you have a pyramid that, helps uh, kind of manage human relationships to all these great beings. Uh, uh, it's, it does produce a lot of spiritual movement and potential here, uh, and also this potential. I don't know if that's the correct word. Uh, but that, if, you, if you want to say that constitutes something like a vortex, uh, uh, well, that... That sounds like that might work. David lives in the valley, which has an altitude of 6,000 feet, but is surrounded by mountains and volcanoes that can go as high as 18,000 feet. The people who have lived here forever, including David, are greatly affected by the environment and the energy in the surroundings. The Nahuatl tradition has been around for thousands of years just like the uh, Veronica tradition. And uh, uh, it's about relationship with the living world and what constitutes livingness. Uh, beyond, of course, for us, it's like, okay, well, I'm a uh, biology or a plant's living or uh, animal's living. Uh, 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 things that appear to be geographical features, mountains, lakes, caves, clouds. Uh, we have a whole rich tradition here of... Uh, it's called weather working, and uh, uh, in which you are you have a relationship with the clouds, and you're called to that. And uh, it brings rains, and it also avoids storms. And uh, and so we're uh, that's been there since since the beginning, uh, as the stories go with tradition. All right. So I guess uh, yeah, I guess in a way, what we're saying is there's a lot of energy beings or if that's the way you describe it, in this area. So do people come 
uh, from all over the world to this region to your area for healings or spiritual connections? Well, uh, Temple Slan has become a lot more popular uh, uh, over the last uh, years. Maybe I would say uh, I've been uh, living in Mexico since uh, what, 94, so, well, 20 some years. Uh, uh, I'd say within the last five or maybe ten years, uh, it's become more popular, and uh, people are seeking. I mean, so you you now it's grown from originally it was uh, uh, when I was in this area it was still uh, Nahuatl, which is the language of the Nahua people, uh, was still being uh, spoken. In fact, my former partner uh, who was here even back in the 50s, uh, that was really the language that was being spoken, was, uh, was Nahuatl. And, uh, and uh, now it's like, it's hard to find people that speak Nahuatl. But, uh, uh, but people have, have uh, come to uh, somehow looking for a house or some place to live here or, or a spiritual uh, healing work, or now there's yoga classes and meditation places. And so you see a kind of a collection rather than the traditional uh, Nawa uh, basis of relationship with the world and their, their view and, and their approach to healing and uh, you know, what constitutes healing. Uh, you find uh, increasingly a kind of a, a hodgepodge of lots of different things. Let's talk about your awakening. You had another life in the States, and after your marriage ends, you move to Mexico. You run into some financial difficulties, and you are stuck. So a friend brings you to a Buddhist retreat, and then what happens? I was out in this garden at the retreat center, and uh, an apparition showed up and uh, scared the bejesus out of me. and. So I thought I was losing my mind. I went into talk to my partner. She was uh, a therapist, a uh, psychologist, therapist person, and I, I needed. I said I'm, I'm losing it. This this looked like a very old indigenous looking kind of Indian guy showed up and started talking to me. And so so she uh, she said, "Well, go find out what he wants." <laughs> Because she was busy talking to her friends, and so I thought, okay, this is just a, this is just a mind fart, okay. And so I went back out to, to uh, I went back out to talk to to see what happened. I said this was just going to be like I just had something crazy happen, and so he showed up again, and and he said, hey, I can help you out with this problem. Uh, uh, with your difficulties if, if you'll become a shaman and I said that sounds fantastic I just knew that this was such an incredible like what was happening here was just so unbelievable that I knew whatever he said I knew it was going to be true so he appeared one more time the day after for after that and he gave me some instructions on learning how to pray because he says if you're going to do this kind of work, you're going to have to learn to pray. So I said, okay. Then, within some short order, he sent me to a, a Varadika or Weetzel shaman, or to a person who took me there, and they he said that he would like know I was coming, and so he said, oh yeah, you're the guy, you're that guy. And then he then he says, you've got to now begin to, you know, be my apprentice, be my disciple and uh, and now and now I found out who this was because this this being was being or this voice now that I would sometime hear uh, uh, this voice that I was hearing that would show up as a kind of a thought form would uh, you know give me a few little things here and there but it was very coy about like who are you exactly is are you a ghost or are you uh what are you and so he says ah you'll find out about me later so you know when you you're going to meet this guy. And so, yeah, he said, the guy said, well, you're, uh, this is what they call Tatawari, and that is uh, Grandfather Fire in the Veronica language. 
he says he's the he's the he's the the first shaman. He's the shaman of all the shamans, and he teaches us everything, or what they call manikami. And uh, so, so, uh, so you better do what he says. Okay, <laughs> I said, okay. Well, I've already made my agreement, and he did deliver it. He, a deal came through, and I was able to solve my financial problems. It was like amazing. They sent me to now being where I'm living here is the Nawa. He sent me to this old Nawa shaman who again said, "Oh, that's Shutkutli. That means that's their. That's a little, little different, but that's their version of of the divine expression of fire, the, of everyday fire of life." And and so, but anyway, since I was hit by lightning, he says at an earlier age, he said, "No, you're you're be called to do this work." So so I had to work with both these. Elders, and uh, and then later on they would upon uh, Don Lucio, uh, Don Lucio uh, Campo, who's the who's a Nawa, uh, very famous uh, Nawa shaman who died at around a uh, hundred. Uh, he gave me his altar to carry on after you know, before he passed, and and Don Lupe uh, Gonzalez Rios, uh, you know he. I went on to be uh, to be connect, get connected with uh, uh, Tatawadi or Grandfather Fire, connected me with with this uh, other uh, Manakami elder uh, who picked up with my initiation and stuff like that. And so, so uh, I've been off the races ever since then. I I do teaching, I do healing work uh, here, but also. Uh, in different places in the world. How do you um, work with your a client? Like, take me through sort of a typical process, and maybe even start with: Is there a common denominator with the types of problems that people come to you for help? And then, how do you help them? Well, gosh, it's like, a, what are what are problems? Uh, well. Of course, when you generalize, you know there's always going to be uh, uh, difficulties with that. But let's just let me boil it down a little bit here. So uh, uh, you have kind of two basic people: one who have gone to have got a difficulty going on that they've tried uh, uh, more mainstream methods uh, or. Uh, you know, somewhere like that, and they have not received the help that they've been looking for. The the healing sessions, uh, depending on where I'm at, are different for different for the two different traditions. The Nawas are very much they you have to have a, an altar and you have to be in your consultorial. Uh, we call them like they're more like village people. So so you need to be at your your place of that. The Varadika are semi-nomadic or have been semi-nomadic, and so where you go and you can build a fire, and so depending on the 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 Varadika have a s- set of tools called mubieris. Mubieris are called feathered wands. Uh, in you know, if you were to describe them in English, and uh, and so the feathered wands are a combination of feathers. And, and they've been taken to very sacred places uh, over time through pilgrimage and, and very strong fasting uh, conditions. And uh, and you take special offerings, and so you present the offerings and the prayers, and and your movieres capture uh, some special healing essence that is known to be held by that special place and you use them for doing uh, what you could say basically is a a limpia or a cleaning and that is you can draw things off of people uh, through that method uh, uh, imbalances uh, that because uh, uh, because illnesses uh, are, are basically imbalances whether they're caused by not so good emotional processes or they've been to places that aren't so good and they get affected by that 
before what can happen here in the village is you know people have uh, uh, jealousies and envies with each other and that's another kind of problem uh, and so you're doing Olympias and same in the Nawa view uh, there's Olympias they have uh, another uh, another view but uh, it's it's uh, and very different types of ways to do Olympias uh, and also a uh, what you could say is uh, uh, would translate out as a type of soul retrieval uh, from frights or problems that that uh, have people not access their soul level, and so you're you're looking at them, you're interviewing them, you're also listening, uh, not just to them, but you're listening to the presence of the the gods, the spirits that. Uh, invoke to be present with you as a way to help guide you to how to approach uh, the, the process and you know will it be Olympia will it be something else will it just be counseling so so how do you look at a disease and it might be different than the medical community say cancer what is it what is cancer okay well let's see to uh, what's happened is that what you would say is okay when we're healthy okay so we're you know if you start looking at us you know well allopathic uh, medicine people you know I have a couple of medical doctors who are students of mine uh, but the so you look at it as as a biological system you say uh, 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 well uh, you have that view of of cancer through mutations and so forth the tradition sees it as okay, when you're balanced okay your spiritual being and when you're healthy uh, then of course that that is a way that all is in balance the forces that are going on inside you and engaging with the forces outside of yourself you know through family and community and and through the spiritual landscape and when something gets off of balance then what happens is that balance in balance what could show up in community uh, but let's stay with where since we're talking about you know, people that starts to show up so now how does cancer show up okay now cancer shows up as a as a form of that there's some calling that you are uh, there's a version of a calling now calling can be you know calling can be just you're supposed to be doing something okay uh, to a level of okay something like what I'm doing that's called a calling okay but there's something important in your life and your your mind and your fear has been stopping you uh, from doing that but the the potential of you need to do that has uh, has, has uh, created an imbalance in a way that suddenly your body just wants to break loose and so Cancer is seen as fire. Cancer is seen as like out of control growth. You know, well, that's how it's observed as out of control growth that uh, uh, breaks out from the natural way that uh, the body, the cells talk to each other. And that's, you know, cancer is like, okay, you one cell bumps into another cell and says, okay, stop growing. And when one, one dies, then another one can come. Okay, so their cells like talk to each other. And so this ignores everything. This ignores and just grows and grows and grows and starts taking resources. So, so what you're doing is you're when you're working on that that approach to to cleaning, which which can be uh, through what I've generically described as lipias, uh, the need for herbs, the need for processes that that now uh, release this imbalance that has caused the uh, what shows up as a rebellion in the spirit body uh, to uh, to uh, just start trying to get out there and force something uh, to happen mm -hmm. and and let's say um, like what does drugs and alcohol do to your mind well there's the good side and the bad side if we stay with alcohol well you would say that the uh, alcohol has been around uh, quite a bit. But let's just stay with, okay, a couple things. Like, say, for instance, here, uh, 
what has been around forever is uh, what's called uh, pulque. So it's it's like a, you cut a maguey plant open and, and uh, a syrup comes out, a kind of a sweet syrup. syrup. It makes a kind of beer with a low, low level intoxication. And so they've used it ceremonially. So what happens is there's a, think of it as a spirit, even though we, you know, we call it, you know, have you had spirits? <laughs> Which usually infer alcohol. I mean, like uh, alcohol meaning distilled spirits. <laughs> Uh, if it's used in the right way, it, it creates a condition where, you know, there's some relaxing and there's some communing. That's possible, whether you're using uh, liquid chocolate, especially mixed, uh, smoking tobacco, uh, whether you're taking tohuino. Uh, that's a level of communing. Those things have properties that allow for some level of communing, whereas we have a uh, we are spiritual beings, but we're also, throughout time, we've also had an impediment to our connectivity. And that has a lot to do with the, the special gift we have called the mind that's also a problem. So it's a, it's a boon and a bane uh, for us. And so uh, doing that, or if you say, well, so some, and it depends on what you want to talk about, drugs, uh, uh, what happens is we have a natural anxiety as part of our human condition. We That disconnection is like, we don't quite, it's like, oh my God, it's like, look at this world around us. It's like, oh my God, it's like, what the heck do we make out of this? Because it's so vast and so, you know, every moment and every, it's like uh, we can structure all kinds of stuff, but we know that it's, uh, it's, we know inside of ourselves that we, like, we're trying to figure it out, and and why are we here, and what are we supposed to be doing, and uh, and so that's a natural. You, it's called uh, I think it's called out there an existentialist uh, dilemma that we have that no other being has. You know, mountains aren't worried about being mountains. You know, the the, the bird doesn't say, you know. Uh, I'm gonna. I want. I like being a squirrel better. Or a river wants to be a desert instead. <laughs> okay. They all are. They get along with this divine reality. But we, we have a problem, and we've always had this problem. Once we've received this, this gift, and so we're at that place between engaging the world and trying to cultivate and maintain some level of connectivity in the face of our mental or ego uh, impediment and the problem with our modern culture is that it's like uh, things get to be a fad like wow uh, boy that really I really like that so how about more more is better <laughs> so let's, let's just kind of jump in with both boots and you know wow I'm gonna let the substance do the lifting for me the heavy lifting uh, so I don't have to participate I don't have to be responsible it's like it makes no sense to to the peoples here, okay? It's like nothing but trouble, and uh, and and the Western culture is always looking for what's the next thing. Yeah, they're still stuck on tobacco. That's why tobacco was like eating them, <laughs> and uh, they never like sat around and smoke that stuff like you know chain smoking. It was all very respectful and ceremonially, just like the Veronica, they don't sit around and drink the wino. Uh, they make it for their occasions. They drink it. They get it kind of con gets connectivity with the the corn mother and the earth and so forth. And now it's time to go back to work. So, uh, uh, so I mean, I could. There's some more avenues there I could mm -hmm. I could explain, but that's no. The it's interesting. That. Uh, interesting that they call it spirits. <laughs> I don't think the connection is that it's adding or connecting you to your spirit, but you certainly, your spirit does change. Well, it, it does because, well, you could say we're a spiritual, okay, we're, uh, let's see, what's the, what's the saying? I, I saw it as a bumper sticker. I said, that's, that's about right. Okay. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. Okay. 
of what constitutes being a human rather than a human being searching for a spiritual experience. And it's like, okay, yeah, we're spiritual beings. Okay, you can say that as a concept. Okay, so like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, okay, really? Like, hey, that's, that's a nice sound, but it makes a nice bumper sticker. <laughs> but what constitutes that? What is it that has people search for that? You know, how do you, how do you define that? Why are we even talking about spirit? You know, the animals and the ants and the bees and the trees and nobody's talking about spirit. Okay, like there's not searching for spirit, you know, they're just being. Mm -hmm. We're a special kind of being that is, we not just see, but we see that we see. We have this, these two animals, this, this disconnectedness. This is part of our, our gift. We not just see things, but we see that we see them. Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting, especially when you think about the comparison to, say, a tree which is just living and happy being a tree, compared to, say, this woman, we're humans. We are always analyzing ourselves, And this constant self-reflection can make living difficult. Finally, the last thing, and kind of sum it up in um, a few words, is uh, what's, what's your life's mission? Oh, my life mission is to, okay. Uh, my life's mission uh, has has uh, now arrived to be that to uh, bring the wisdom of these these two very ancient traditions and how they see the world and how that can impact our lives in a very important and a very positive way, especially in these times, uh, uh, to bring that back into that, that uh, birthright into humanity and, uh, and all that that encompasses, whether it's ceremonies or healing work or just... Uh, putting up with me talking so and, the, and and just remind us again or explain I guess what what are the two um, um, they're not modalities the traditions traditions yes so and tradition is something that has been uh, well what are the what are the names what are the, that's what I was yeah it's the uh, Varadika or most commonly known as Wichol mm -hmm. and uh, the Nawa. Okay, so people can look up if they want to read more about those. So they can probably Google that and find more information. Exactly. They should find a lot of that. Well, David, thank you so much. I really appreciate you and uh, doing this. And, and maybe we'll continue at some other point or do some other content. Uh, I really enjoyed talking to you. I learned a ton. Very good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, if, I, I, if this can be helpful in some ways, just let me know.